Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 223 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the Victorian mystery of spring Jack. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1837, residents of London were shocked when a ghostly figure named spring Jack began appearing and frightening people. He would wear outrageous costumes and surprise them, sometimes bellowing blue flame in their faces, only to make his escape and vanish into the night. Who was spring Jack? Did he really exist? And who might he have been? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, where does our mystery begin today? In the area around London, England, in the year of our Lord, 1837. At that time, there were multiple local villages around the city, most of which have since been swallowed up by it and become suburbs. And something strange was going on in the villages. A mysterious figure now known now known as spring Jack was starting to appear. The first strange report came from Barnes, which is on the southwest side of London. And there, in early September of 1837, a ghost imp or devil was said to have appeared in the form of a large white bull and attacked a number of people. Other reports started coming in from elsewhere. For example, in his paper, spring Jack to Victorian Bugaboo from Suburban Ghost, historian Mike Dash reports, Several of these reports added further, if utterly contradictory, details to the monster's description. In the appropriately named Cutthroat Lane, Isleworth, a carpenter named Jones claimed to have been attacked by a figure dressed in armor with red shoes, etc. When he fought back, two more ghosts joined in the struggle on Jack's side. Jones was badly beaten, and his clothes were torn to shreds and thrown away. Jack was said to have appeared in St. John's Wood late in December, and early in January clad in mail and as a bear and to the west of London as a devil equipped with iron claws, which he used to attack a blacksmith and a number of women. I really want to recommend Mike Dash's work because he did an extensive review of the original sources on spring Jack and helped to separate what was claimed at the time from what later authors said. In any event, by December, the London newspapers were starting to report on these events, but they were skeptical, saying that they were the kinds of stories that circulated among servant girls. However, they didn't rule out the possibility that there was something at the base of them. And on January 9th of the new year, the Lord Mayor of London, Sir John Cohen, was holding a public session in Mansion House, which is the official residence of the Mayor of London. And he revealed he had received an anonymous complaint a few days earlier that said, To the right honorable the Lord Mayor, my Lord, the writer presumes that your Lordship will kindly overlook the liberty he has taken in addressing a few lines on a subject which within the last few weeks caused much alarming sensation in the neighboring villages within three or four miles of London. It appears that some individuals of, as the writer believes, the higher ranks of life have laid a wager with a mischievous and foolhardy companion, name as yet unknown, that he dares not take on himself the task of visiting many of the villages near London in three disguises, a ghost, a bear, and a devil. And, moreover, that he dare not enter gentlemen's gardens for the purpose of alarming the inmates of the house. The wager has, however, been accepted, and the unmanly villain has succeeded in depriving seven ladies of their senses. At one house, the man rang the bell, and on the servant coming to open the door, this worse than brute stood in no less dreadful figure than a specter clad most perfectly. The consequence was that the poor girl immediately swooned, and has never from that moment been in her senses, but on seeing any man, screams out most violently, Take him away! There are two ladies, which your lordship will regret to hear, who have husbands and children, and who are not expected to recover, but likely to become a burden on their families. 
The affair has now been going on for some time, and strange to say, the papers are still silent on the subject. The writer is very unwilling to be unjust to any man, but he has reason to believe that they have the history at their finger ends, but through interested motives, are induced to remain silent. It is, however, high time that such detestable nuisance should be put a stop to. I remain your lord lordship's most humble servant, a resident of Peckham. I'm always a bit perplexed by um, these reports of, you know, someone saw something shocking and then they went out of their senses and they're not expected to recover. It's like, wow, were people really that mentally fragile back then? <laughs> In any event, after reading the letter, the Lord Mayor indicated that since these things had not occurred in the city of London itself, uh, there wasn't anything he could do. But spring Jack was now in the press, and details of his appearance were being reported. For example, on January 10th, 1838, the London newspaper The Sun published a story in which they said, Hampton Wick, Hampton Court, etc., soon run with the mighty deeds of an unearthly warrior clad in armor of polished brass with spring shoes and large claw gloves, who, whenever pursued, after frightening not only children but those of an older growth, scaled the walls of Bushy Park and instantly vanished. But the son was skeptical about the accounts they had gathered, writing, In consequence of the above ridiculous stories, some parties adopted every means for obtaining information on the subject and personally visited the places above mentioned. It was found that although the stories were in everybody's mouth, no person who had actually seen him could be ascertained. So the paper checked, and they couldn't find anyone who had actually seen the mysterious figure and only heard stories about him that appeared to be just rumors. However, the next month, on February 20th, 1838, we come to one of the best attested encounters with the mysterious figure when he attacked a young woman named Jane Alsop, uh, who lived at Bearbinder Cottage in Bearbinder Lane near the village of Old Ford. According to the Times of London, At about a quarter to nine o'clock, she heard a violent ringing at the gate at the front of the house, and on going to the door to see what was the matter, she saw a man standing outside of whom she inquired what was the matter, and requested he would not ring so loud. The person instantly replied that he was a policeman and said, For God's sake, bring me a light, for we have caught spring Jack here in the lane. She returned into the house and brought a candle and handed it to the person who appeared enveloped in a long cloak and whom she at first really believed to be a policeman. The instant she had done so, however, he threw off his outer garment and applying the lighted candle to his breast, presented a most hideous and frightful appearance, and vomited forth a quantity of blue and white flames from his mouth, and his eyes resembled red balls of fire. From the hasty glance which her fright enabled her to get of this person, she observed that he wore a large helmet, and his dress, which appeared to fit him very tight, seemed to her to resemble white oilskin. Without uttering a sentence, he darted at her, and catching her partly by her dress and the back part of her neck, placed her head under one of his arms, and commenced tearing her gown with his claws, which she was certain were of some metallic substance. She screamed out as loud as she could for assistance, and by considerable exertion got away from him and ran towards the house to get in. Her assailant, however, followed her, caught her on the steps leading to the half-door, when he again used considerable violence, tore her neck and her arms with his claws, as well as a quantity of hair from her head but she was at length rescued from his grasp by one of her sisters. Miss Alsop added that she had suffered considerably all night from the shock she had sustained, and was then in extreme pain, both from the injury done to her arm and the wounds and scratches inflicted by the miscreant about her shoulders and neck with his claws or hands. Afterward, the Alsops reported the event to the police, and so now there was someone who had definitely reported seeing spring Jack and to have been attacked by him. That incident occurred on February 20th, and a few days later, another attack occurred. Mike Dash writes, Five days after Jane was attacked, spring Jack appeared again in the east end of London. This time he knocked at the door of 2 Turner Street, off the commercial road, within easy walking distance of Old Ford. When a servant boy answered the knock, Jack threw down his cloak and presented a most hideous appearance. The shocked boy screamed so loudly that Jack fled without accomplishing anything further. 
So that seemed to be an aborted encounter because Jack just ran off when the boys screamed. But on February 28th, spring Jack appeared again. This time it was in Limehouse, and the people involved were a woman named Lucy Scales, as well as her sister and brother. According to Edmund Burke's annual register for 1838, At Lambeth Street Police Office, Mr. Scales, respectable butcher, residing Narrow Street, Limehouse, accompanied by his sister, a young woman, 18 years of age, made the following statement relative to the further gambles of spring Jack. Miss Scales stated that on the evening of Wednesday last, at about half past eight o'clock, as she and her sister were returning from the house of their brother, and while passing along Green Dragon Alley, they observed some person standing in an angle in the passage. She was in advance of her sister at the time, and just as she came up to the person, who was enveloped in a large cloak, he spurted a quantity of blue flame right in her face, which deprived her of her sight, and so alarmed her that she instantly dropped to the ground and was seized with violent fits, which continued for several hours. Mr. Scale said that on the evening in question, in a few minutes after his sisters had left the house, He heard the loud screams of one of them, and on running up Green Dragon Alley, he found his sister Lucy, who had just given her statement, on the ground in a fit, and his other sister endeavoring to hold and support her. She was removed home, and he then learned from his other sister what had happened. She described the person to be of tall, thin, and gentlemanly appearance, enveloped in a large cloak, and carried in front of his person a small lamp or bullseye, similar to those in the possession of the police. The individual did not utter a word, nor did he attempt to lay hands on them, but walked away in an instant. By now, the public was on the lookout for spring Jack, and he started to have imitators. Mike Dash reports. By now, all of London was thrillingly aware of the spring Jack scare, and several imitators made their appearance. On either 28 February or 1 March, a genteelly dressed man who had called at the White Lion Pub in Veer Street Cooley told the landlady he was spring Jack, pulled out a self-protector club, and aimed a vicious blow at the woman, which fortunately missed. At about the same time, a man in a cloak grabbed a woman in Lincoln's Inn Fields and slapped her face. While in Islington, a blacksmith named James Priest was apprehended after assaulting several women and sentenced to three months hard labor. During March, two tall men in black cloaks with faces smeared with ochre scared a boy in Westmoreland Mews. And a youth named Daniel Granville was caught in Kentish Town wearing a mask with blue glazed paper at the mouth to simulate Jack's fiery breath. He was discharged with a caution, but another imitator, James Painter, was fined four pounds or $380 today for his exploits in the Kilburn area dressed in a bearded mask and a sheet. Finally, at the beginning of April, as the terror seems to have died down in London, a woman was assaulted on the clifftops at South End by a gentleman who threw her to the ground, tore at her clothes, and stuffed grass in her mouth. Though this assault had little, save the clothes tearing, in common with the modus operandi of the real assailant, the local paper nevertheless headlined it, Spring Hill Jack at South End, a good indication both of how far the general panic had spread and of how Jack's name was already becoming a convenient one to link to any scare or physical assault. After that, spring Hill Jack sightings more or less stopped in London, but they started being reported in other parts of Great Britain. In the 1840s, he was reported in Devon, Chichester, Northamptonshire, and East Anglia. He was reported again in Devon in the 1850s. He was reported in Middlesex in 1863, And in the 1870s, there were a bunch more reports. In 1872, he was reported back in London in Peckham. Actually, this was a figure known as the Peckham Ghost, but the press identified it as Spring Hill Jack. The next year, in 1873, he was reported in Sheffield. In 1877, he was reported at the British Army camp at Aldershot. Uh, This account was written up in the Illustrated Police News, which was not a very reliable publication. But it was also written up in the local military newspaper, Sheldrake's Aldershot and Sandhurst Military Gazette, which stated, Someone or other appears to have made up his mind to play some rather questionable pranks with the sentries at this camp while on night duty. About a week ago, it appears, but we do not vouch for the correctness of the story, a sentry was on duty at the North Camp, and about midnight someone came towards him, 
who refused to answer to the usual challenge of who comes there. And after dodging about the sentry box in a fantastic fashion for some little time, made off with astonishing swiftness. Not, however, until the sentry had loaded his rifle and fired, but without any effect. Spring-heeled Jack, as he's been termed in camp, then paid a similar visit to the sentry on duty near the cemetery, who also fired, but alas, without hitting the object at which he aimed. What or who the individual who is thus amusing himself might be, we do not know. But such little bits of fun might be carried just too far. An enjoyment of this kind had better be discontinued before one of the nocturnal pranks leads to unpleasant results. However, these antics weren't discontinued, and they kept happening. Uh, one of the officers at Aldershot, Lord Ernest Hamilton, recorded in his book, Forty Years On. Life at Colchester was on the whole unexciting. But in 1877, the monotony was pleasantly relieved by the appearance on the scene of an elusive midnight reveler known as spring Hill Jack. This mysterious being was responsible for a series of visitations which shook the nerves of the entire military camp to their foundations. Night after night, sentries would be bonneted, cuffed, and thrown down by an invisible assailant. Cavalry, infantry, and artillery were all alike impartially victimized. In our own cavalry barracks, the story told next day by the nerve-shattered wrecks who had been on sentry duty the night before was that spring Hill Jack came flying, without any preliminary warning, over the top of the stable buildings, dropped on their shoulders, knocked them down, and was gone before they could recover their feet. Other reports were to the effect that a snow-white figure suddenly appeared from nowhere, hurled the sentries about with superhuman strength, and vanished into thin air. All accounts agreed that Spring Hill Jack's movements were absolutely noiseless. The whole population of Colchester, both military and civil, was deeply stirred. Sentries were everywhere doubled and even then went on their rounds with shaking knees and perspiring brows. Also in 1877, Jack was reported in Newport Arch in Lincoln, Lincolnshire. There, he was reported to be wearing a sheepskin, and he got mobbed by a crowd who chased him up on top of the old Roman structure Newport Arch. A couple of people shot at him, but he got away. In 1888, Jack was reported in Liverpool, and in 1904, for what would be his last traditional appearance, he was again reported to have appeared in Liverpool. And thus ends the commonly accounted sightings of spring Jack. If these are the common reports of spring Jack, it sounds like he made a big impression on the public. Did he have a broader effect on popular culture of the day? Absolutely, he did. In addition to all the reports of him across the country, uh, he was incorporated into children's puppet shows like Punch and Judy. Uh, he also featured in what were called Penny Dreadful magazines. And he shifted from being a bad guy who attacked people to being a protector of the innocent and a costumed avenger who righted wrongs, making him a kind of early superhero. In the early 1940s, there were rumors of a similar figure in Prague, Czechoslovakia, about a spring-heeled man who taunted the Nazis. And at the end of the war, the animator Yuri Trnka uh, did an animated short subject about that, which we'll have a link to. In the 1960s, spring Hill Jack was rediscovered, but this time by the UFO community, who sought to interpret him as an alien stranded on Earth, and he's continued to influence pop cultures ever since then. Excellent. Wow. Well, we'll get to our theories about spring Hill Jack in our Faith and Reason perspective in a moment, but first we'd like to take a second to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Lisa R., Andrew S., Caitlin D., Chris G., and Michael M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fairvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about spring Jack? 
there have been a bunch of theories, including that he was a demon because it's always it's always demons, demons. <laughs> and an alien because it's always, it's always aliens, aliens. <laughs> as well as naturalistic explanations like he was a normal human being or possibly a gang of normal human beings or that he was simply a legend and never really existed. OK, what can we say about Spring Hill Jack from the faith perspective? Well, we don't have good evidence that he was a demon. Uh, some people of the time may have interpreted him that way, but we don't have good evidence of him doing anything particularly demon-like. Uh, he may have scared people, but lots of things scare people, so that's not particularly demon-like. And a lot of the details we have indicate he was a flesh-and-blood creature, so I think we can set aside the demon hypothesis. And what can we say about Spring Hill Jack from the reason perspective? The first thing to consider is whether he could have just been a legend. I find this view hard to credence because we have early accounts from him in 1838 in which multiple people saw him at the same time, like when he attacked Jane Alsop and was seen by several members of her family in Old Ford, or when he encountered Lucy Scales and her sister in Limehouse. He also left physical evidence when he attacked Jane Alsop, and both families reported these encounters to the police very quickly thereafter. So I think we have something more than just a legend to investigate here. What about the other reports across the 19th century? They didn't end until 1904. I don't see how an individual person could have been active from 1838 to 1904. That's a period of 66 years. And if spring Jack was just 20 years old in 1838, he would have been 86 years old in 1904. And that's too long a time for a single individual to be responsible for all these encounters. I, I don't think that all of the reports of him are accurate. For example, the story of him appearing at Newport Arch is reported by the Illustrated Police News, which, as we've said, is not a reliable publication. And that encounter is not mentioned in the local newspapers uh, of that area, which suggests that it's a false account. But we've already heard that he was attracting imitators early on in 1838, and I think it's quite possible that after the initial series of attacks, various people continued to imitate spring Hill Jack in different parts of the country. Uh, some of these may have been one-off imitators, but there are two cases where I think we can take a closer look. The initial 1838 attacks in the London area, and the 1877 attacks at the Aldershot Army Base. Let's talk about the abilities Jack was said to have exhibited in some of these, like breathing blue flame and being able to leap unusual distances. Based on these abilities, do you think there's a reason to suppose that Jack was an alien stranded on Earth? I don't. Um, spring Hill Jack was said to have four unusual abilities. Unusual leaps, fire breathing, talons, and being bulletproof. When it comes to the unusual leaps, this appears to be an exaggeration. As Mike Dash points out in his review of the original news coverage, the early witnesses in 1838 didn't see anything like that. Uh, the Alsop family saw Jack flee by scampering across the fields, uh, and Lucy Scales' sister just saw him walk away. In the 1877 accounts, the witnesses didn't see any unusual leaps either. Uh, Jack may have jumped down from height in these cases, which is something anybody can do if you climb up high first, but people don't seem to have seen him jumping up unusual distances. It's only in later secondhand accounts that we find him making unusual leaps. He was known as Spring Jack or Spring Heel Jack, though, and we saw a reference to him having shoes with springs on their soles from early on in an 1838 issue of The Sun. Yes, but we don't see him doing anything intrinsically inhuman. Uh, as a result, we don't have evidence to support the idea of an alien. It's more likely he was just an agile, active man, like many people thought he was, and that this led to the idea of him having spring soles on his boots. In reality, they do make shoes with springs on their heels today uh, for people who have problems uh, with their backs or who have plantar fasciitis. 
I've known more than one person who's worn them, but they don't let you make phenomenal leaps. They just lessen the impact of taking a step and redistribute the weight of your body as you do so. Fundamentally, what controls the height of your leap is determined by your leg muscles, not the soles of your feet. Of course, you could increase the size of the springs, but that would interfere with your ability to walk normally when you're not leaping, and it would likely lead to dangerously uncontrolled leaps. So I don't think that the idea that he had springs sold shoes is particularly likely. What about his ability to breathe fire? This is a common circus trick. Uh, Traditional circuses have fire eaters, and spitting fire is a common technique that they use. The trick is called the human volcano or fountain of fire, and it's rather dangerous, which could explain why spring Jack only did it early on in 1838. Also, notice that we have fire on hand, I mean, an open flame on hand in the two good reports of this that we have. There is Conflicting eyewitness testimony about whether it happened at the Alsop house in Old Ford, but according to Jane Alsop, Jack, who was impersonating a policeman, requested that she go get a candle, and when she brought it, he, or while she was bringing it, he could have taken a swig of ethanol alcohol or another substance, and ethanol does burn with a blue flame. Then when she brought him the candle, he breathed blue flame in her face. Also, when Jack menaced Lucy Scales, he brought a lantern out of his cloak before breathing the blue flame. So some in the UFO community have proposed that the blue flame actually came from a gas gun that Spring Hill Jack was carrying. But the primary sources don't indicate it was coming from anywhere other than his mouth. So it looks like a circus trick that Jack did with fire he brought with him in the case of Lucy Scales, or with fire that Jane Alsop brought to him when he requested the candle. What about the talons spring Jack was said to have? He probably did have talons, at least the ones, at least the encounters in 1838 did, although there are no good records of him in 1877 having talons. The talons probably were exactly what the newspapers said they were, clawed gloves. And Jane Alsop got a look at them and said they appeared to be made of metal. So nothing that would particularly indicate an alien, just a guy with metallic clawed gloves. What about the fact that people were said to have shot at spring Jack, yet he seemed invulnerable to built bullets? This is something that comes up in particular with regard to the 1877 spring Hill Jack at the Army base, and it appears in the secondary literature, not in the original accounts. For example, Mike Dash writes, In fact, as the original sources made clear, Jack's invulnerability to bullets probably owed more to a combination of poor shooting and blank rounds. Nowhere in the available contemporary material is there any suggestion that bullets passed straight through the Leaping Terror. On one occasion, in April 1877, a sentry did load and fire at Jack, but without any effect. The Times added a little more detail in its report on the same incident. A soldier, in his excitement, loaded his rifle and fired, but missed his aim. From here, the ghost went towards the military cemetery and, in a similar manner, attempted to frighten a private in the 100th Regiment who was on guard by a powder magazine and was again fired at, but without being hit. Sometime later, Jack appears to have escaped injury at Aldershot when a sentry fired a blank warning shot at him. But the most interesting comment on Jack's supposed invulnerability to bullets appears in the police news's coverage of the Aldershot scare. The sentries had lately been ordered to fire on the ghost and were loaded with ball, but this precaution had lately been given up And Jack pursued his old tactics on Friday last. So it doesn't look like we're talking about a person who is invulnerable to bullets, just a person who got lucky and wasn't hit. Then let's talk about who spring Jack may have been. Can we say anything on this front? Actually, yes, we have some good candidates. First, let's look at the 1877 Jack. He began his activities in April of that year and got shot at and he then waited until August to resume them. But by that point, according to the Illustrated Police News, the precaution of having sentries loaded with ball rather than blanks had been relaxed. As Mike Dash reports, If correctly reported, 
This suggests not only that the reason why Jack waited from April until August to renew his activities around the barracks may have been an actual fear of being shot, but also that he was in a position to know when the order to load with live ammunition had been rescinded. The implication is that the Aldershot spring Hill Jack was, as many contemporaries supposed, himself a member of the garrison. And that's exactly what Lord Rutherford wrote in his biography 40 years on. The men themselves were firmly convinced that spring Hill Jack was the devil. We in the officers' mess were just as firmly convinced that it was Lieutenant Alfrey of the 60th Rifles. Probably both were wrong. Alfrey was a very big and powerful man, but extraordinarily active. He used to come out with the Essex and Suffolk's hounds on a gray polo pony of about 14 hands, and it was the prettiest sight in the world to see the two in combination. On approaching a five-barred gate, Alfrey would vault off his pony's back whilst in full career. He and the pony would then jump the gate side by side, after which he would vault back into the saddle and continue the chase until the next gate was reached, when the performance would be repeated. Our suspicions that Alfrey was the culprit were strengthened when we moved to Aldershot in the winter of 1878. The 60th moved to Aldershot about the same time, and at once Spring Hill Jack made his appearance in the new camp and commenced his old pranks on the night sentries. At Aldershot, the general panic became so great that eventually Spring Hill Jack was officially proclaimed in general orders. Ball cartridge was handed out to the sentries, and these were ordered to shoot the night terror on sight. These measures proved effective, and Spring Hill Jack was seen no more. Whether it really was Alfrey or not, I've never learnt, and it would be interesting to have some pronouncement on the subject from his own lips or from his own pen. His equipment was supposed to consist of rubber-soled shoes and a sheet which was white on one side and black on the other. And that sheet would allow him to suddenly appear or disappear depending on which way he turned it. So the fact that Spring Hill Jack's appearances tracked with the movement of the 60th rifles and the fact that they stopped after Jack was put in the general orders with shoot on sight instructions could all support the hypothesis that this version of Jack was Lieutenant Alfrey, though the matter isn't 100 percent certain. What about the 1838 version of Spring Hill Jack? Do we have an idea of who that was? There are two good candidates here. Uh, one of them is a carpenter named Thomas Milbank, who had a companion that was a bricklayer named Payne. The reason that they came under suspicion is that, the, is that a man named James Smith witnessed the encounter with Jane Alsop. Mike Dash explains. The testimony of a coach wheelwright called James Smith seemed particularly devastating. He said that he'd been walking up Bearbinder Lane when he heard screams coming from Bearbinder Cottage. Hurrying on, he had met Payne and Milbank walking away from the house. Milbank was wearing a white hat and a white fustian shooting jacket, which Leah plainly believed was the white oilskin garment Jane Alsop had described. Smith and another witness named Richardson testified that they did not see any blue flame at Bearbinder Cottage, just the candle that Jane Alsop brought out. But Smith did see Milbank and Payne later that night in the Coburn Road. Payne said to the other, it was rascally. I would not have had it done upon any account or words to that effect. I was carrying my work upon my shoulder at the time and they recognized me. And the man in the shooting jacket said, there's the blank who was in the lane. He then came up to me and caught hold of the wheel I was carrying and pulled it off my shoulder, saying at the same time, What have you to say to Spring Jack? I desired him to leave my wheel alone, and then Payne came and took him away. I went into the Morgan's Arms public house, and they followed me in and went into either the top room or parlor. I inquired of the landlord who the man in the shooting jacket was, and he said that his name was Milbank and that he resided nearly opposite to his house. I have no doubt but that the man Milbank was the person who had so frightened the Mrs. Alsop. So according to James Smith, it was Thomas Milbank who was Spring Hill Jack. However, Milbank denied it and said he was so drunk that evening he didn't remember much. And Jane Alsop and her sisters were sure that the man who had confronted Jane had not been drunk. The police thus ordered further investigation, but it wasn't productive. Mike Dash writes, a shoemaker named Richardson, who had also been in Bearbinder Lane shortly before nine, said that he had met uh, not only Milbank and Payne, but also two other possible suspects. 
a boy and a young man in a large cloak who, in rather a joking or laughing manner, said something about Spring Hill Jack being in the lane. This, too, was a suspicious circumstance, since at the time no one but Jane Alsop knew that her attacker had identified himself as Jack. The identity of the cloaked young man is one of the mysteries of the Alsop case. Smith was insistent that he was actually Milbank, while Richardson was equally adamant that he was not. Further information provided by a gentleman from the Old Ford area who had conducted his own inquiry to allay, if possible, the terror that had spread over the neighborhood served only to confuse the issue. He had identified a man named Fox who admitted to being in the lane, accompanied by a boy, when Jane was assaulted, but who also asserted that he had not been wearing a cloak at the time. Not surprisingly, little was resolved by this inconclusive investigation. At the end of the second day of hearings, Mr. Hardwick, the chief magistrate, told Milbank, the chief suspect, he now believed him innocent. So this ended rather inconclusively. Also, Milbank lived very near the Alsop family, and Jane didn't recognize him as the man who spoke with her. Furthermore, Milbank was said to be older, shorter, and heavier than the man who did speak to Jane. Thus, it may have been someone else. You said there was a second suspect in the 1838 cases. Who was that? You'll recall the, that the letter that the Lord Mayor of London received said that spring Jack was a nobleman who was fulfilling some kind of bet made with his associates. That was a common view at the time, and attention centered on one particular man, Henry de la Poer Beresford, the Marquess of Waterford. He was born in 1811, so he would have been 27 in 1838, making him the right age, and his in his youth, he was quite a wild guy, nicknamed the Mad Marquess. There are even legends that he was responsible for the phrase, paint the town red, as he and a group of his fox hunting buddies allegedly painted the village of Melton Mowbray with red paint after getting drunk, though this is doubtful. In any event, the idea that spring Hill Jack may have been a nobleman has a basis. Uh, both the witnesses from the Jane Alsop case and the Lucy Scales case indicate that the person they saw was a gentleman, which meant more than just a man at the time. I mean, today we say ladies and gentlemen, just meaning men and women. But at the time, a gentleman meant a man from the upper class. Further, Mike Dash writes, such a relatively well-funded group would undoubtedly have had the means to travel from the far west of London to the East End, which in the days before public transport would have been a significant problem for the less well-off. According to one letter writer, it is stated that some individual gentleman he has been designated drives about with a livery servant in a cab and throwing off a cloak appears in these frightful forms. They would also have the time and motivation to make many appearances in many different guises. A party of aristocrats might also be assumed to have access to the coat of mail and the bearskin Jack was rumored to appear in, which any poorer imitators probably would not. Furthermore, there are a couple of reports which suggest that Jack did not act alone and was able to call on the assistance of some like-minded colleagues to carry out his assaults which ties in neatly enough with the notion of a group of wild young men out to settle a wager. The disappearance of the original Jack in February 1838 might be explained either by the fulfillment of the terms of the bet or by its abandonment in the face of increased police activity. While the idea of making a bet makes a lot of sense, uh, it's less certain that it was the Marquess of Waterford who was involved. There are some dubious details in later sources that could suggest this, like the servant boy who saw Jack on February 25th reported seeing a crest with the initial W on his clothing, you know, possibly W for Waterford. But details like that are only in the later literature, not in the primary sources. However, it's certainly consistent with Waterford's known character at this point in his life, and so people accused him of being responsible for the 1838 attacks. Jimmy, what is your bottom line then on Spring Hill Jack? Spring Hill Jack is a fascinating Victorian mystery. The evidence points to him being real, not just a myth. In fact, the evidence points to there being more than one Spring Hill Jack. The earliest sightings in 1837 and 1838 may have been produced by a young nobleman, such as the Marquess of Waterford, 
And there were certainly later imitators. And in the 1877 sightings at Aldershot, they were likely produced by someone serving at the base, such as Lieutenant Alfrey. But whoever was responsible, the encounters gave us one of the most enduring figures from the Victorian era, and spring Jack remains popular today. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers? We'll have a link to Carl Bell's book, The Legend of spring Jack, which focuses on Jack as a pop culture phenomenon. We'll also have a link to the book Penny Dreadfuls, Volume 5, which contains a spring Jack Penny Dreadful. Also, information about spring Jack, the Marquis of Waterford, Mike Dash's paper on spring Jack, which is extensive and very valuable for the information it contains. Also, Edmund Burke's annual register for 1838, which we quoted from, Lord Ernest Rutherford's book, 40 Years On, and the 1945 Czech cartoon by Yuri Trinka, Spring Man and the SS. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, people will remember, uh, many of them, that we talked about a monument known as the Georgia Guidestones back in episodes 141 and 142. And unfortunately, recently the Guidestones were destroyed. There had been controversy about them ever since they were unveiled in the 1980s. Uh, People thought they were somehow connected to the Antichrist because it's always the Antichrist but they really weren't, um, as we discussed in the two episodes. Um, But there have continued to be controversy about them in Georgia, and in July, someone in the dead of night detonated a bomb at them, and it destroyed part of the structure. Um, the, uh, The remainder of the structure had to be destroyed for safety reasons, and so we don't have the Guidestones anymore, and it's not clear to me that they're Gonna, that they're going to be rebuilt or anything like that. I don't think they have the funds for that, although it's possible someone could start a, a fundraising campaign. The police have uh, footage of the explosion itself because there was a surveillance camera there, and they also have footage of a car that left the scene shortly thereafter. So uh, they're asking the public for help on that. Something else to be aware of, there was a plan to bury a time capsule at the Georgia Guidestones, Um, but it it appears that never happened. And after the Guidestones were destroyed, um, there's an internet meme started claiming that the time capsule had been dug up and, and talked about things it included. All of that's a hoax. That's just an internet meme hoax. There was no time capsule. And so we'll have a link both to an article about the destruction of the Georgia Guidestones and about the time capsule not being real. But even though now the Guidestones, of course, were called America's Stonehenge, although there are actually several structures that could uh, could fit that description. And if you if in the absence of the Guidestones, if you have a need for a Stonehenge like structure, you might consider Manhattan. Because on the island of Manhattan, there is an event that occurs on four days a year in May and July known as Manhattan Hinge, where you've got these giant skyscrapers and the sun lines up with the skys- with the skyscrapers. Um, so we'll have a link to, uh, to footage of Manhattan Hinge from this year that you can uh, see what all that is about. Excellent. So that's it from us. We would love to hear from you. What are your theories about spring Jack and his antics? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. Send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Send a tweet to at mys underscore world or join the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord or call our mysterious feedback line at 619 619- 738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special thank you to Oasis Studio 7 for doing the video and animation work in this episode. You can check out their work by going to youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, which is my YouTube channel. They do a lot of really great stuff, so be sure and check it out. And while you're at my YouTube channel, I'm trying to grow it. So I'd really appreciate it if you would uh, subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you always get notified whenever I have a new video, whether it's Mysterious World 
or something else. Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to be starting to take a look at the famous 20th century psychic Edgar Cayce. We'll be doing a two-parter on Edgar Cayce, talking about his abilities. Uh, Next week, we'll talk about his life, and then we'll go into analysis mode and see what we can figure out. Excellent. Folks, be sure to share the podcast with your friends and write a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from. That helps us grow this community and reach more listeners. You'll find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 223. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com. A-A-R-O-N-V dot com. Making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Thank you.